What's the creepiest ghost encounter you've ever had? Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. I've never lived in a haunted house, but my mother did as a teen. Other houses on her street had strange things going on too. A few homes away from her lived a family. One night, the daughter went to bed with a bad headache. The next day, she was dead, she passed away from an aneurysm. After her funeral, the family went away to get their minds off the tragedy, and the father asked my uncle, my mom's brother, to check on their pets. My mom and dad, who were dating at the time, went with him, my mother had heard there was a grand piano, and she wanted to play it. My dad was studying to be a veterinarian. After entering the house, my uncle and my father headed to the basement to see the animals, and my mother went to the piano on the ground floor. She was playing it when she felt something brush her ankles. She thought a cat must have left the basement and walked past her. She kept playing, and then she felt it again. She looked under the piano and saw nothing. When she started again, she felt hands clasp her legs tightly. She dashed to the basement door, called my uncle and father, and waited for them. Back outside, my uncle could tell my mom was rattled and asked what was wrong. She told him what had happened, and he turned white. He told her the daughter who had died used to play a game with her father. When he played the piano, she'd crawl underneath, grab his ankles, and push his feet up and down on the pedals. The ambulance company that I used to work for had a haunted ambulance, Rig 12. A lot of EMTs had stories about it, but I never put much stock in paranormal stuff. That is, until I had my own experience with Rig 12. My partner and I were working in a rural community at 3 a.m., and it was pitch dark and completely quiet. We were both dozing, I was in the driver's seat, and she was in the passenger seat. I woke up to a muffled voice, but I thought my partner was talking. I told her I was trying to sleep and closed my eyes. I distinctly heard a male voice say, oh my god, am I dying? Followed by a few seconds of heavy breathing. My partner and I sat up straight and looked back into the patient compartment, where it sounded like the voice had come from. Things were quiet for a couple of seconds, then we heard the click of an oxygen bottle regulator and a hiss, as if it was leaking. I turned on the lights, and we ran out of the rig. I thought a transient might have climbed in while we were asleep, so we opened the rear doors. No one was there. I checked the oxygen bottles, neither was opened. We didn't sleep much after that. My neighbor Diane and I had a playful poltergeist for years, and we called it Billy. I'd come home and find something put in a weird place. Milk in a cupboard, toilet paper in the fridge, laundry detergent in the bathtub. Diane once called to ask if Billy had been around, because she couldn't find a gallon of milk. We finally found it outside on her back steps. And sugar, darn sugar. Every morning, my sugar bowl was empty. When I'd had enough, I would point to Diane's home and yell, go see Diane. Within five minutes, I'd get a call from her. Thanks a lot, she'd say. He'd gone and pulled shenanigans at her place. This occurred for the entire two years we lived there. No one believed us, not even our husbands. My mother thought someone was stealing from us when we were sleeping or out of the house. My sister believed something was going on but didn't know what. I still can't explain any of it. I don't believe in ghosts, but, after all, no matter how a ghost story begins, it always hinges on the notion that, come on, of course, we believe in ghosts. A few years ago, I moved into a one-bedroom apartment in Melbourne, Australia. It was my first time living on my own. The apartment block had been built in the 1930s. I'd been there for a few months when I came home from work one day and went into the bathroom. I saw something strange. A wooden board, which had covered a hole in the ceiling that led to a small attic space, lay fractured in two pieces on the ground. I examined the pieces. The board was an inch thick, and it would have taken Bruce Lee to break it. I thought the landlord had sent someone to work on the attic. I was frozen stiff with fear. Someone is up there for sure, I thought. I emailed pictures to the landlord, asking if anyone had been there, with an undertone of annoyance since she hadn't warned me. Her reply read, please call me as soon as you are able to. I called, and she explained that her last two tenants had said the same thing happened. She promised to replace the board, and she did. A month later, I woke up one night around 4 a.m. 
My body was covered in goosebumps. It felt like someone was rubbing his or her hands on me. Everything was silent, but then I heard a dragging sound coming from above my bed. It was as if someone was pulling a sack of potatoes. I froze, convinced someone was up there. There is no way an animal could make that sound. After five minutes, I worked up the courage to turn on the light, armed myself with a cricket bat, and walked to the bathroom. That's when I saw that the new board covering the hole was broken in two. I felt sick. The dragging sound had stopped, but I heard something else, whispering. The sound was clear and coming from the attic. It sounded like children's voices, and I could hear one sentence repeated over and over, it's your turn, it's your turn. I switched on every light in the apartment to make things feel normal. It was 5 am and dark outside. I watched TV to try to unwind, then a fuse blew. My pet budgie, Dexter, whom I kept in the kitchen, usually never made a sound at night, but he started squawking like he was being strangled. I'd never heard him make those sorts of noises, he was screaming. I grabbed my car keys, ran out, sat in my car, and waited there until the sun came up. When I saw people walking their dogs, this comforted me enough to go back in. The front door was open, but I figured I might have forgotten to close it when I ran out. I went to the kitchen to check on Dexter, but he wasn't in his cage. I felt sick again. All my windows were closed, so I looked everywhere inside. When I walked to the bathroom, I heard splashing. Dexter was half drowned in the toilet. I took him out, washed him, and dried him. I was so confused. At 8 AM, I called the landlord and gave her a watered-down version of the night. Oh wow, you heard the whispering too, she said. I stayed in that apartment for another 18 months. I heard the whispering on a few occasions, and twice the board covering the hole in the ceiling moved. Although I live elsewhere now, the landlord recently called. She said that her new tenants had begged to speak with me about some of the stuff that's been going on there. Forget it, it's their problem now. One night when I was 10, I was woken up by my bedroom door opening, followed by someone sitting on my bed. I felt my leg grazed and the bed sink under a person's weight. It's just mom, I thought and I opened my eyes. It was not my mom. I found an eyeless boy, he had black, empty sockets, about my age sitting at the foot of my bed. He extended his hand, and in it was a little box. I was startled but reached out. He pulled back. I reached again and said, give it. Then I blinked, and when I reopened my eyes, he was gone. But I could still see the imprint where he'd sat on my bed. Fast forward five years, my girlfriend came over to do homework. After she finished, she took a nap while she waited for her parents. When they arrived, I tried waking her up. She opened her eyes suddenly, looking up at a corner where the wall met the ceiling. She pointed there and went back to sleep. I shook her again, she came to full consciousness, and I explained what she'd done. She looked haunted. Up on the wall, I saw a little boy with no eyes. He was there, in a Spider-Man pose, staring at me. I freaked out and told her my story about the same kid. Fast forward another five years, I was with the same girlfriend, and we had a two-year-old. We were living in my parents' house, in my old room. My daughter started waking up at the same time every night, and she'd talk. After a while, I noticed she had almost the same conversation every night. I playfully asked her once whom she was talking to. She said, it's a little boy, he's nice. He's lost and looking for his mommy. My daughter's nightly conversations continued until we got our own place later that year. This happened in 1972, at a party hosted by University of Michigan students living on Ashley Street. A 15-year-old girl, who probably had no business being there in the first place, suddenly felt a strange, bone-chilling cold. In an attempt to warm up, she went upstairs, because heat rises we guess. That's when things really went awry. One of the walls of the house started moving, and a black shadow approached the girl. Meanwhile, downstairs, posters were spontaneously popping off the walls and falling into a growing pile on the floor. The girl wandered back downstairs, where she found herself saying these strange words. The drugs and addiction were my fault, and I accept responsibility for that, but I was not that way deep down inside. I want to apologize to everyone involved for what I have done. What made those words even stranger was that the girl did not do drugs, let alone have an addiction. Her words didn't seem all that strange to the students who lived in the house. 
Before they moved in, the house had been inhabited by a man with a very serious addiction. The reason he no longer lived there? He had died of a heroin overdose. Has the ghost of Ashley Street made any more appearances? That remains a mystery. I'm 52 years old and have had five paranormal experiences, three of which, possibly four, involved a ghost. The most recent was January 5, 2011. My grandmother passed away on 1st of January 2011. I was very close with her and was her favorite of nine grandchildren. I was born in Connecticut and lived in Connecticut until 2002 when I moved to Arizona, I have been here since. I returned a few times to visit but she had never been to my house in Arizona. When she had died, I had recently started a new job and couldn't get the time off to return for her funeral. On Wednesday January 5th, I had returned home from work at about 4.30 pm and walked into my house. I went in through the garage, through the laundry room and turned right into my living room headed for the kitchen when I noticed something on my left. I looked to see what it was and it was my grandmother standing in my living room near the entertainment center, and she was talking to someone on her left side that I couldn't see. I also couldn't hear anything. She was almost solid at the head and shoulders, but her body was almost transparent. She had a look of concern and confusion on her face and was wearing a pink floral dress, which I found out later on that she was wearing at the wake. She was looking right past me into my kitchen as though I wasn't even there. I stood there in disbelief for a few seconds, and when I said grandma under my breath, she just faded away. The whole experience lasted less than 5 seconds. I have replayed this over and over again in my head, and the only thing that I can come up with is that her wake was at the same time that I returned home from work and she didn't see me there. Maybe her guide brought her to me to see I couldn't be there. I don't know, but I wish I did. I'll probably never know, but then again, I might get some answers when my time comes. A was coming home at midnight on his bike. He saw some lady on the side of the road asking for lift. She was also crying. He thought she needs help and gave her a lift. In the meantime, he asked her name and her destination, but she kept crying. After repeatedly asking when she did not answer, he stopped his bike and said he cannot take her anywhere if she does not tell him where she wants to go. Then she lifted her hand and finger to a small lane which was very dark and no one to be seen there. He turned his bike to the lane and drove. But even after driving several kilometers, the lady did not ask him to stop. Finally, he stopped his bike again and turned back. But to his surprise, the lady was gone. A bad smell remained. He looked at the surroundings, it was a place for cremation. Frightened he took a U-turn and drove to full speed. He could not believe he was with a ghost for sufficient time. So when you are with a ghost, all you can do is be strong and not weaken yourself. You are lucky you helped an unsatisfied soul. Then forget the whole incident and do not rethink. Remember, you have with you the most powerful entity, the Almighty. I was living in a house in Laguna Beach that had been there since the 1920s. In its history, it had been a speakeasy, a brothel, and a house for smuggling illegal immigrants. One day, my new wife and I were having an argument. I can't even recall what it was about. She walked down the block to get a cup of coffee and cool off, and I was alone in the house. From my bedroom, I could look across the hall into the bathroom, then through the bathroom and down the other hall. I was standing at my dresser, and I just noticed movement out the corner of my eye, and looked down there. There was, and honest to God, this gives me goosebumps just typing it, 17 years later, a black figure. It was maybe 3 feet tall, and it was only vaguely humanoid. It looked like black scribbles, like someone had scribbled a human shape, but the scribbles moved, like electricity arcing, that's the best way to describe it. There was no sound that I could remember. I distinctly remember when I saw it I wasn't afraid, just like, what the hell? Then it noticed me looking at it. I can't say it turned around, it just focused on me I guess. Then I was scared, I didn't move, didn't scream, nothing, I was just frozen, because it just freaking came at me, it rushed down the hall towards me. I have no idea what it intended, but as soon as it entered the bathroom, the door closest to me just slammed shut on it. Then I screamed, I yelled for my wife. She wasn't home. I went outside, into the daylight, and didn't go back in until she got home about 10 minutes later. About 10 years ago, I was 8, I was visiting my dad at his house. 
My stepmother was in the kitchen and I was in the family room. We both saw my father, wearing a red flannel shirt and blue jeans, walk around the corner from the living room and start walking up the stairs. I followed him and called his name as he went up the stairs. He turned back and looked at me, got to the top of the stairs and went around the corner. I called his name again, then from the living room my dad popped his head up over the couch and asked what I wanted. He had been asleep on the couch the entire time, yet both my stepmother and I clearly saw him, wearing the clothes he had on the whole day and all, go from the living room up the stairs. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. Both my stepmother and I still remember it and talk about it to this day. Also, it was broad daylight, so it wasn't some uncanny illusion of the night. In 2000, my husband, who is from Stockholm, Sweden had a strange encounter in the apartment we are living in. He works late in the night repairing computers, and he went upstairs to the kitchen to get some coffee. He went through the dining room to the kitchen and the light switched off. He believed it to be a mechanical failure, as he's an engineer. He tested the switch and it worked fine, and again went out of the room and the light switched off. This was the beginning of a serious haunting that scared the daylights out of us. Later that night, a bag of oranges which was sitting on the cupboard spilled out and oranges were all over the floor. That was enough to convince him that this was an out of the ordinary experience and he hid under the covers. My dog and cat refused to go into the dining room and kitchen, which was where all the incidents occurred. They would cry and cower in fear when the entity was about. The incident started escalating and a crucifix I had on the wall was laying on the floor, knives would appear on the table, when there wasn't anything there the night before and noises, which sounded like a child crying would come from the dining room corner. There was a cold spot in the center of the dining room and I always felt chilled going there. Shortly after this started, I had company over for dinner and was setting the table and put placemats on the table. As soon as I moved to another setting, the placemat flew off the table. Then chairs started moving on their own accord. This continued for approximately six months and both my husband and myself were living in fear of the unseen. Electrical interferences started happening whereby a light bulb would last approximately one week, the television was constantly flickering, static noises came over the radio and things would disappear that I know were in plain view. I decided enough was enough and contacted the Paranormal Society in London asking for an address for Eddie Burke, a known ghost hunter, who stated in his book that he could remove ghosts from any location, as time and distance do not matter in the spiritual world. I sent him a floor plan of my home and within two weeks of sending it to him, the ghosts were gone. As Eddie is in his 80s, I hope that he has a prodigy to take his place, as this was a very frightening experience to go through. Today the apartment feels warm and safe and I do not sense any beings present. Following is one of the spookiest incident I've ever witnessed and this is not a story, it's a fact. A very good friend of mine just after his 22nd birthday lost his mom due to some chronic disease. Since being the only kid in the house, he was pampered a lot by his parents and especially his mom. He also crazily loved his mom and his signs of depressions were clearly seen when his mom was hospitalized. After she passed away, there was a sudden change in his behavior, he avoided personal interactions and stammered while talking to us. After a week, he didn't bother meeting us, after around a month's time when we were coming back from a movie, we saw him at his balcony in a weird position. It was looking like he was climbing the grills at his balcony like how Spider-Man climbs the wall, and we were quite surprised looking at him. We did wave at him, but he didn't wave back at us, which confused us even more. The next day too, other friends from our group also saw him in the exact same position. And no price for guessing, he became the point of discussion amongst us. To find out what's happening, we decided to meet him the next day, and he spoke as if everything was okay. But his eyes didn't seem right, the dark circles around his eyes made him look like an owl. We asked his dad about his behavior. His dad at first didn't find anything unusual, maybe because of his work, but post we convincing him, he came up with an idea of keeping an eye on him. He also asked us to be with his son for the weekend and we did oblige to do that. Which turned out to be one of the biggest mistake what I made till date. We saw our friend this time not climbing the grill, but his own wardrobe and sat there talking with himself, seemed like he was sharing his childhood incidents. All this was in his eyes open, so we thought there is no case of sleepwalk. We immediately ran up to his dad and got a doctor to look at him. 
When we got him down and doctor asked him what was he up to, the answer made us pee our pants. He said he will not climb to the grill or wardrobe if his mom won't need him at those places to talk to him. I just got back from the city today, and I am never going back. When I exited the building, I saw hundreds of people walking limply on the opposite side of the sidewalk. It appeared that they only went in one direction while walking, but what scared me was there was no one else on the streets but them, and their faces were drained of color and emotion. I crossed the road over to them, not even one car passed by. I got over to them and began following them, asking for an explanation and got no reply. I felt like I walked for miles, with no clear destination with the walking crowd. No one would talk to me, not even acknowledge my existence. Their faces still devoid of any emotion, still looking forward, as if drawn in by some unseen force. I felt like I was losing my sanity, I started to question whether this was a dream or not. A taxi suddenly stopped right beside me, and the driver beckoning me to get in, his face was pale as if he had seen a ghost. We traveled opposite the direction of where the people were walking to, and I realized that there seemed to be an endless line of them just walking in one direction. I questioned the driver as to why he picked me up so suddenly and where he was taking me. What he said chilled me to the bone. I just saw you walking on that empty street over there seemingly talking to no one, I just wanted to take you to the hospital to see if you were okay.